Welcome to The Forecast. I'm Jason Grigsby, one of the partners at Cloud4, and we have an exciting episode for you today. As you may have heard, on March 12th, Google made a change to the way it ranks web pages in its search results. In particular, it replaced FID with INP in the Core Web Vitals that it uses to evaluate a web page's performance. Now, did that sound like gibberish to you? <laughs> a bit of acronym soup? Well, don't worry. That's why we're here today to clear that up. And we have a phenomenal guest to help us with it. Uh, Tammy Everett is a longtime user experience and web performance expert. She wrote a book called Time is Money, The Business Value of Web Performance. She helps curate WPO stats, which, or um, to WPO stands for Web Performance Optimization Stats, and it keeps track of performance success stories. So if you're looking for examples of how performance impacts business, you can go to that site and you can find really great examples. It was also the inspiration for our own website, PWA Stats, which does something similar for progressive web apps. Not only is Tammy a sought after speaker, she's also the co-chair of the annual Performance Now conference, which takes place in Amsterdam this November. Tammy works as the chief experience officer for Speed Curve. And more than all of that, Tammy is an exceptional human being and tremendous commuter, contributor to the human or to the web performance community. Tammy, welcome to the show. Oh, what a nice intro. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, you're um, welcome. I, so I laugh every time I hear, um, I think uh, it was a couple of performance dot nows ago that somebody coined the term TLA, three letter acronyms, and how much in our industry we really like our TLAs. So I was like, yes. TLA, FID, WPO. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, a big part of my job is um, slowing down and explaining to people what the three letter acronyms are and you know, evaluating are they even helpful? Are they measuring what you need to measure? Like, what do, you, what do we actually learn from all these TLAs? Well, that's excellent, because that's that's really what we want to get into today. Um, and I think we should start with some of the basics, like just to catch people up to speed. And um, let's start with Core Web Vitals. Like, what are they and why should website owners care about them? Yeah, so um, a little history of Core Web Vitals. It feels like they've been around kind of forever in tech years. Um, they're really only about four years old. It's a Google initiative that started in 2020. Um, and the focus was to kind of take, you know, we have this ever increasing swath of metrics to use to measure, you know, various things like rendering times and how pages are built and other things to do with web performance um, and to kind of simplify it because it's pretty overwhelming and to simplify it down to a set of currently three metrics that are intended to let you know how to measure performance from the perspective of like what, what actually matters to users. And so right now, those three metrics are largest contentful paint, which is the kind of loading um, metric. It lets you know that the page is loading, something meaningful is happening on the page. Um, interaction to next paint, which is the interactivity metric. So it just lets you know how interactive the page is. Um, are there any interaction delays or responsiveness issues? And the visual stability metric, which is cumulative layout shift. So short form, LCP is largest contentful paint, INP is interaction in X paint, and CLS is uh, cumulative layout shift. So those are those. So those are the three metrics. Um, they are among the page experience signals that Google fa Google factors into its search ranking algorithm, hence all the fuss, because when Google says something is part of its search algorithm, everybody sits up and takes notice. In that respect, they've been really great for the performance community because they've gotten a lot of people other than performance engineers and developers to think about and care about web performance. So like kudos to the everyone at Google on their, the, the team who it develops and con continues to maintain Core Web Vitals. Um, but I think the, the, the thing that gets a little bit lost is that they're just part of the ranking algorithm. We don't actually know how much weight they have. Yeah. And um, today, there are there, and there are other ranking factors like, like mobile friendliness or security or accessibility, absence of interstitials. Like there's all kinds of things that go into that. So focusing just on core web vitals and kind of leaving those things behind is, um, is not recommended. Um, and also it's really important to, to remember that since core web vitals have been announced, 
um, I think a lot of good things have happened in terms of people caring about performance and trying to optimize for those metrics, but we don't actually have any meaningful case studies that show us the impact of Core Web Vitals on SEO. And I'm kind of just saying that up front because it inevitably it's the question that people ask me. And unless right. you know, maybe one of your listeners has has one, they can share with me. I would really love to hear it. But to date, there aren't there aren't any. Yeah, it's interesting. We were working with a client um, a couple of years ago. Um, now, maybe maybe a year ago, I can't remember. But um, they had an SEO firm that was um, seemed to know their stuff, right? Like there are multiple times where I talk to SEO folks, and I'm not so certain. But this this group really seemed to know, um, seemed to be very knowledgeable, and when I double check things, seemed to match up. And they were incredibly focused on Core Web Vitals as a key thing that was going to help them in their rankings. And they would actually see, as we started implementing faster pages and started seeing Core Web Vitals go up, that they were actually seeing a um, an increase for their search engine rankings and the amount of traffic they were getting. Now, I didn't have access to any of that data. I was just hearing it secondhand, so I can't. I can't speak to a case study. I don't know what difference it made. I don't know if there were other changes, uh, but we did make a substantial um, increase in performance overall for them. That mm -hmm. was part of what we were working on, um, and they saw that reflected in, you know, in SEO and in traffic. Um, so it, it makes sense to me that, um, you know, to the degree to which it, the algorithm that Google uses is a complete black box. Um, but you need every little edge that you can get that you want to care about core web vitals if you're a website owner. Um, and it also yeah, makes sense for users. Um, it, absolutely. And kind of like to that point, um, there are really good case studies around core web vitals and other metrics, other business and engagement metrics. So if you go to um, web.dev and look at the case studies that Google has collected, um, and, and other places, you can actually see that, you know, improving INP, improving LCP has also improved revenue, conversions, time on site, like, you know, a swath of other metrics. So I don't mean to say that, you know, that SEO can't also be improved. Right. I exactly. guess it kind of just, um, my, my colleague, Andy proven. Davies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We just, we just can't demonstrate SEO exactly but we can demonstrate a lot of other helpful things which you should also care about. Right. Um, my colleague, Andy Davies, who some of your, your audience might know, he's um, a performance person from years and years back and he uh, has probably forgotten more about performance than most people <laughs> will ever know. Um, he breaks it down. He, broke it, um, he has a really good breakdown where he talks about SEO as being about user acquisition. So you should care about performance and SEO from an acquisition perspective, but then you should keep caring about vitals and other you know, performance metrics from a retention aspect. So in the short run, unfortunately, we're kind of hearing more and more about um, companies, agencies, consultancies, and, and I believe most of them are doing things that are above the board, but a few that are kind of gaming some of the core web vitals to get that SEO boost. And it's really kind of a short lived strategy because at the end of the day, it's not going to get you retention. So, you know, trying to game your, your, your metrics doesn't really get you very many places. And also like right. even Google will, will tell you that the metrics don't matter as much as the content on the page itself. So having great metrics is not a substitute for original content um, and like really meaningful original content. So I would always recommend like, you know, it's important to care about SEO, obviously, but don't make your pages faster or optimize for your metrics solely for SEO purposes. You do it for your users, as you said. Right. So let's, um, uh, you, you did a good job of describing the three, the current three core web vitals. Um, but this is new as of March 12th. Um, and it used to be, uh, instead of INP, um, interaction the next page, it used to be FID. Um, and I wonder if you could talk just, you know, briefly about what FID was or is, I suppose it's still around and why there were problems with it. Why did Google decide to replace it? Yeah. Um, so the well, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier is how these metrics are actually measured. Like what are the tools that we use to, to, to measure these? 
Um, and so the, the Core Web Vitals are measurable in any real user monitoring tool. So basically any, any tool that you're using on your pages um, that measures real user experiences and real in the way that actual users interact with your pages. Um, and Google also, in terms of the thresholds that it's created, because I didn't, I didn't mention those, Google has sort of recommended thresholds um, for the different metrics that are kind of good, needs improvement and poor. And the recommendations are to um, kind of achieve those numbers or ideally achieve the, the good number at the 70th percentile of your users. So what that means is, for example, uh, for largest contentful paint, which is that loading metric that kind of tells you, okay, when is the most meaningful visual element above the fold rendered? I know we're not supposed to say above the fold, but I say it anyways. Um, and uh, so you, you want to know that it is uh, rendering in under two seconds, which is Google's threshold. And, and you want to know that it's doing that at the 75th percentile. Um, so uh, basically, so that 75% of your users are getting that experience of LCP happening at two seconds or sooner. I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way because getting into talking about FID, um, it's an interactive interactivity metric and a responsiveness metric that um, measures actual user interactions. So how quickly the page responds to the first user interaction, specifically a click or a tap or a key press. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing about that was it was a good first attempt uh, just like understanding, like it's not just about how quickly the actual content renders, but how that content behaves when people interact with it. So it was a it was a first step, but the gaps sort of started to appear pretty quickly. Where um, you realize that it's not measuring the overall responsiveness of the page because there can be multiple user interactions on a page, and actually, like that overall responsiveness really matters. Like 90% of the user's time on the page is spent after it loads. So you want to act, capture as many different interactions as are happening on the page. And another telling thing that kind of exposed maybe some of the weakness of, of FID, first input delay, is uh, my colleague Cliff Crocker did an analysis pretty early on with FID where um, he, among other things, looked at how FID correlated to business and user engagement metrics. So in performance, um, if you're capturing real user data, you can actually create something that we call correlation charts, where you correlate your performance metrics, like FID or like any right. start render or anything else, with your business metrics like conversion rate or user engagement metrics like bounce rate, really any of the metrics that you can capture. So the idea is that if FID was meant to be a user experience signal and a user experience oriented metric that any changes, good or bad to FID, should affect, you know, some kind of business or user engagement metric. Um, it's, you know, FID gets better, conversions get better, that kind of thing. And what, we, what Cliff found was that changes in FID really didn't correlate with any changes in those metrics. And so we realized we, we, clearly it's not quite capturing exactly what we need to capture from a usability, from a user experience perspective. So that's kind of, so, so in the background, while, and I think it was pretty early days when a, lo a lot of people, including the, the, the Google folks who work on the, the, the Vitals team, um, sort of realized that these cracks existed and they have been exploring interaction in next paint. Um, as a potential replacement for quite some time, because um, these things obviously aren't trivial to you know implement and introduce. So I'm going to stop talking for a second because I need to drink my tea. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> it's getting really dry and I'm talking too much. Um, so, do you have any questions about anything this? Well, I've said so yeah. Much? So um, it seems like um, the way that I have been thinking about the difference between the two is that. Um, FID, or um, which I didn't realize we were we were pronouncing it instead of uh, sounding it out. I guess the, I've been too isolated for the last few years, um, or saying FID. Um, but that FID uh, was really just measuring like the first thing that somebody did on a site. So if if somebody built a site, um, you know, like I, you know, we see this a lot where you've got a web page and the web page loads, and then like. A bunch of other stuff loads like a bunch of other javascript loads later um that the person could have a, if they're if they happen to click in that window between when that initial stuff loads 
And when the later things load, they could have a good experience for their first click, but their second click could be really slow because, you know, like the chat bots loading up or something of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. And the way that I understand INP is that it's an attempt to sort of capture that entire experience better, um, whether it does or not, um, I guess remains to be seen, but that it actually is attempting to, you know, look at all of the clicks that somebody has on a web page. Exactly, exactly. So um, INP, it, it still only focuses on clicks and taps and key presses. Um, so, you know, it's the, th that's kind of the extent of it. But it measures all of the user interactions on the page and it gives you a single value rather than, so, um, and, and, and you can, yeah. So a good INP is under 200 milliseconds. So basically it's saying that if a user is on your page and they're clicking on various things, the sum total of all the response time for, for those various interactions should not exceed 200 milliseconds. Yeah, which that's a, sounds like a lot because it's a three digit number, but 200 milliseconds is, is no, 0.2 it's seconds. Fast. So it's yeah. really not very much time at all. So um, it's one of the things that I heard a lot about um, sort of last year as people were talking about this transition, um, but that I haven't, really circle back. It looks like some of the folks at Speed Curve may have done a little more analysis on this, um, was to try to understand how many sites were doing fine with, with FID, but mm -hmm. maybe, you know, failing INP. Um, and it seems like that there, there may be quite a few of them. Um, uh, so we have, so we haven't analyzed our own customers mm -hmm. because there's sometimes issues with you know, doing analysis of aggregated data and the kind of the right. agreements that we have with our customers, what we're able to do. Um, but Cliff, um, my, coll my colleague Cliff, again, mm -hmm. did an analysis of the top million websites via the HTTP archive okay. and kind of looking at sites that had good FID versus good INP. And what he found was that um, for FID, it was really easy to have good FID, like almost 100% of death is like, desktop sites had good FID and about 93% of mobile had, had good FID. So those mm -hmm. are really good numbers. And so a lot of people were really complacent, but it almost kind of worked against FID because people just stopped thinking about it or caring about it. Everybody, everybody just kind of, it became a metric that was really easy to ignore because it was always going to be in the green for you. Looking at the numbers on um, for INP, however, kind of paints a different story. So numbers are still pretty good on desktop overall. Like for the the top million sites, it's something like ninety six percent of uh, desktop sites have good INP. But for mobile, it goes way down, and only two thirds of of mobile sites have good INP. So still, I mean, roughly sixty five percent is pretty is pretty good. But right. it's not great. Like I wouldn't no. want, you know, I would still want to and make sure that I'm not in that one too. Like those are the ones that presumably have larger budgets and people spending, you know, working on them more professionally exactly. than maybe the smaller, you know, like a mom and pop e-commerce site or something of that nature. Correct. Yeah. And then Cliff did some other interesting research. Um, for example, like just kind of looking at the meaningfulness of INP. Um, we did find that INP does correlate more closely to business metrics and oh, that's great. things like that. So that was kind of just like, a, it's almost kind of our first, it's our go-to whenever a new metric comes out, if it's measurable in RUM, can we create a correlation chart to see if it actually, you know, kind of moves the needle on any of your, your, your important other business, business metrics. Um, and then interestingly, Cliff also found that mobile INP matters even more than desktop INP. So there was an even stronger correlation, um, to, you know, to good or bad uh, INP and good or bad, you know, conversions or bounce rate or anything like that. So um, the, the, the challenging piece there is that INP is harder to optimize for on mobile but it's if you have a, like a large swath of your users that are coming, you know, to you via mobile, you're really going to want to make sure that you are optimizing for them because you have there's there's more potential there to move the needle on your business metrics if you do. Gotcha. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, it's great too if you manage to make your site fast on mobile, then it will be 
it'll fly on a desktop site or desktop mm-hmm. browser. Exactly. So as far as speed curve and the um, to the degree to, to which you can talk about these things, like what are you seeing mm-hmm. at speed curve with companies trying to adapt to INP or is it a big concern? Is it something that um, people are struggling with or is it um, something that, you know, that they're already well suited for? Um, so in speed curve, and I think a few other tools as well, we've had the ability to track IMP for quite some time. So we were ready for the transition. We actually have a really good relationship with the Google team. We meet with them once a month and kind of share what we see kind of in the wild and they share what they're doing on their end. And it's, it's, it's really helpful and super collaborative. Um, so uh, yeah, with, like companies have had lots of leeway to adapt. There are still some people who, I would say it kind of runs the gamut. So the people who saw it coming, wanted to be ready for it, kind of ahead of the game, and they were. And then, you know, definitely a fair share of companies that uh, realized maybe kind of it got real for them, like maybe in January or February or even just now, and kind of realizing that they've got some catching up to do. And um, so, you know, a, a lot of the conversations that I'm having, because I talked with a, a lot of our customers um, pretty regularly, uh, is just around turning on tracking for INP, understanding what it's measuring, and as importantly, understanding what it's not capturing for you. Um, and I can kind of go into that a little bit if that's yeah, that something great. that, yeah. So, um, so it's funny. So the the there was all the hype around IMP. I kind of jokingly started calling it the Barbie movie of performance metrics because <laughs> it was it was. There, I've never actually seen, so I've been doing performance stuff for like 14, 15 years now. Um, and I've never seen as much hype around a single metric as around INP. If you were like, it was, it was released on March 12th. And if you were on social media, like tech social media on March 12th, it was literally, you're just scrolling. It was like, INP this, INP that, that kind yeah, of, yeah. like, it would be really easy to take away from that. Like, oh my God gosh, this is the only metric that matters. I just need to focus on IMP and forget everything else. And I, a little bit of that did kind of trickle over to me through, you know, kind of through the, through um, speed curve and talking to customers. So um, it was a lot. Some of the conversations I had were like, it's okay. It's just one metric among many. Like it's, you know, it's a good one to track. Um, You know, if your IMP is really poor, like, you know, and, and you've had pretty good, you know, SEO, you know, ranking, like you've been in that top 10 for a while and you get crawled and, you know, yeah, that might actually, you might take a little bit of a hit from that for sure, but there's room to recover. Um, the other caveats around INP that people might not be aware of are that it's, it's a very narrow set of parameters that are, that, that are, um, in terms of the cohorts that are being tracked. So what I mean, but, but it's still a very large group. So what I mean by that is INP is only supported in Chromium based browsers on mm-hmm. non iOS devices. So what that means is that uh, it's, it's not captured in, in, in other browsers. Even if you're using a Chrome, a Chrome type browser on a, an iOS device, it's not captured in that either. Right. So it's really important to know that and to look at your RUM data and see where your actual users are coming from so that you can prioritize, like, how much do I actually need to care about this? And, and, I'm, and, I say, and I, I'm not saying you shouldn't care, but I'm saying just kind of how much. So, for yeah. example, um, I was speaking with a customer last week and they were, ask, they were asking about IMP. It comes up at every call. And um, when we looked at their RUM data, we realized, okay, well, half your traffic is coming from iPhones. Um, A little chunk is coming from iPad. Another chunk is coming from Safari. So it's like, as soon as you saw that, it was like, okay, well, actually only about maybe 25, 30% of their traffic was coming from a Chrome browser on a non-iOS device. So it's still a pretty significant chunk of traffic, but you know, not everything. So I guess the, the, the thing that I've been coaching people on is definitely optimize for INP because Google search cares about it. And you want to make sure that you're showing up well in Google search results. It's still like, I think something like 80% of, of um, market share in terms of search. 
Right. Um, but then don't assume so that, so that's kind of the SEO kind of side of things, but then in the tracking side of things, don't assume that what you're measuring in rum is capturing all your user experiences because it's, it's really, really not. And so you could have a really huge black box around a big chunk of your users. So that's a quite an enormous caveat that I, that I, you know, try to share with people. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, um, one of the things I guess from like a, um, just general industry perspective that I was, I'm hopeful that maybe some focus on IMP will help with is, um, reducing the amount of JavaScript that is in pages and the amount to which we, um, burden users with that. And I think you see that really, particularly on the underpowered mobile devices, um, where, you know, iPhones generally are more expensive, higher performance, you get the mid tier and low tier Android devices, and they don't have the CPU capacity to kind of handle the amount of JavaScript that some sites are using, um, particularly sites that are sort of built around uh, single page applications and sort of expecting the web browser to build the application on the fly. Um, and those are actually the sites that I worry about the most when it comes to trying to fix INP because it seems like they like particularly like a single page application, maybe built in react and like with a ton of JavaScript in it, um, it might be hard to make the transition to having something faster that doesn't have um, delays. Um, for uh, like, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but it does it does seem like a bigger a bigger undertaking um, for for those companies and for others. And it does you know like um, like you said, even in that example, it's still like a quarter of their users who might be um, impacted by by um, well, I guess I guess you said a quarter were Chromium users, not necessarily Android Chrome, uh, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of Android users. Um, yeah. And they, yeah. <laughs> so, and and a way to think about it is, um, really, mobile INP right now is Android INP. So, if you are you know, tracking INP from from mobile, that's that's kind of what you're, yeah, what you're get, what you're learning about. Um, it's funny. I have just as an aside. I have a almost eight year old iPhone seven, mm-hmm. <laughs> and to your point about JavaScript, like I can tell. Like I almost want to play a game with myself where I'm when I'm using an app or or visiting a site and my phone starts to heat up, like yeah. how many scripts are on on the the site. Like just you can just it's like it's like I'm so sorry CPU, you can just keep keep doing your thing, you know. And uh, it's it's kind of crazy. Yeah. So you mentioned that you've been um, sort of looking at INP from a different angle that I've, I've really heard anyone else talking about it thus far, which is, um, sort of researching and thinking about UX ramifications of INP. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this? Like, how do you see, um, you know, INP impacting UX? I guess the, the core thing that I am focused on when I talk about INP with people and when I investigate INP is reminding people that it's not an SEO metric, it's a UX metric. Like mm-hmm. the purpose of it is to measure interactivity. So um, kind of just to what I said before, like the, if you're not thinking about it that way, then you're not really going to be able to communicate the importance of it as well as you might be able to with other people in your organization. Because, you know, we talk about these TLAs, um, devs, engineers, other folks who are kind of deep in the weeds, um, we throw around these terms and they don't mean anything outside our little circle. So if you want to actually get other folks in your org to care about any metric, it's finding that usability slash business angle. So again, it's kind of going back to what I talked about earlier, like that first principle of like, okay, we have a, a, a metric that claims to be a UX metric. How can we correlate it to something in the business? So making sure that you do that. So you can talk about the metric in business terms. So we can say that, you know, um, this page is really janky because it has, you know, a poor CLS score because CLS kind of measures 
how how much the visual elements on the page are kind of moving around and 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 um and it has poor interactivity because you know you're clicking on things and they don't happen and all those things have a real impact on real people and how right. they feel when they're using your site and so I think it's really easy to kind of lose sight of that whenever we're kind right. of like I need to make sure I've got an INP of you know 150 milliseconds yeah. things like that yeah it's this weird I mean this has been a challenge for a while, right? The the idea of whatever, um, you know, like, I mean, going back to the Weisslow performance rules and the Weisslow extension, right? Where mm -hmm. um, is the goal to have a better experience or is the goal to get the top grade? Um, and mm -hmm. a lot of organizations, um, like the, and the nice thing about, well, Core Web Vitals is there. There seems to be a real emphasis on trying to create um, metrics that measure real user experience in a like to the degree that we can. Which mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether we ever truly can, but um, but you know, get as close as possible. Um, but the it's, I think, kind of human nature to just be like, I want to pass these three things, I, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, and call it good or get a hundred on Lighthouse or whatever it is. Um, yeah. One of the things that, um, like, to that point, is like, one of the things that um, has come out of some of the research we've done in looking at correlation charts is, again, if you're just going to unquestioningly look at a threshold that Google or someone else has defined. And I'm not like, I think somebody has to create thresholds if only as a starting point, it's like somebody has to write that first draft and put it out right. there. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good place to start from, but if you're only focused on that and you're not actually looking at your own users and your own user behavior, you could be, you know, you could be thinking that you're fine and you're actually not. So what I, what I mean by that is, um, as an example, uh, I was looking at the correlation chart, uh, some correlation charts that Cliff created as part of his INP investigation. And one of the things that jumped out at me was that um, looking at the swath of, um, like, say, conversion rate to various um, INP times, mm -hmm. we saw that, oh, okay, great. As INP improves, conversion rate also improves. That's great. Right. But it wasn't always consistent with Google's thresholds. Like, so for example, one site, um, actually, it was 100 milliseconds. So that was the 100 millisecond point, not the 200 millisecond point, wow. was where we started to see a difference. Some, for some other sites, it was later on. For some, it was like, it was pretty much dead on, which was, you know, kind of, it's a testament to whoever at Google kind of did this meta research to kind of come to that, to that 200 millisecond threshold. But it's important to remember that these thresholds that are, recommended to us are recommendations um they're based on looking at metadata like aggregated data across right. a lot of different sites not your own site so you could think 200 milliseconds is great but actually for your own site it would be better for you to kind of move more of your users over to that 100 millisecond point and ideal and see and see conversions go up overall for your business um, there's a, a term that we use in looking at correlation charts called the performance plateau and that's basically when conversion just sort of plateaus. Like, mm -hmm. so you um, say you see a jump in conversions if your site goes from, uh, or sorry, say you see a decrease in conversions when your site goes from like two seconds to three seconds. You know, it gets a bit slower um, and then it kind of stays at that uh, lower conversion rate um, for four or five more seconds you could think that making your site a second faster for a user or for the swath of users who are getting five seconds for INP or, or sorry, that's a terrible number, five seconds for a largest contentful page, right. moving them over to four seconds is going to make a difference. It won't. It's not, it's not going to be until you get them off that plateau and back in that zone where making an improvement improves conversions. I don't know if I explained that well, and I don't no, know if the that, air drawing that charts totally makes really sense. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so it sounds like one of the recommendations um, you would make for website owners is to take these performance metrics and try to do that correlation to connect it to the 
the key performance indicators that matter to their business, um, like mm-hmm. conversion rate, things of that nature. Are there other recommendations you would make um, to people who might be worried about IMP and what it means for their business? Yeah. So, I mean, the first one, the one you just said is huge, just validating that it's a meaningful metric for you. Um, so as I said earlier, looking at your RUM data and kind of just seeing, do I even have a significant, you know, portion of users that for whom this is super relevant? Um, if you do, yes, validating it, um, looking to see where, uh, what the threshold for your own site should be. So maybe it's not 200 milliseconds, as I said, maybe it's 100 milliseconds. Um, optimize for IMP like as much as you realistically can. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I said, kind of at the top of the of, of this conversation, um, make sure your content you know your content matters too. So you know it's it's if 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 you can get um, your metrics to a pretty good point. Um, and it can like kind of decide what's good enough for that particular page so that you're not kind of overly optimizing it and, and not really making a difference. Um, I would also say, don't just measure core web vitals. Uh, so for example, like if you care about understanding actual user experience and you know that you need to measure all of your users, Um, then there are some other metrics that I would recommend checking out as well. So, uh, for example, long tasks time, it is broadly supported, supported across browsers. It's measurable in synthetic tools and in real user monitoring tools. Mm -hmm. And what it measures is the slow JavaScript on your page. So any long, a long task is any JavaScript task that takes more than 50 milliseconds to execute and and do all the stuff that it needs to do. So it's a it's it's a major cause of delayed responsiveness. So it's a it's a pretty good proxy for IM key. Okay. So I would really recommend tracking long task time, and then as a companion to that, uh, total blocking time, which is uh, which measures blocking JS, and it's kind of similar to long task except that it's only measurable in synthetic, and it's uh, going to look at just like all of the long tasks that are blocking rendering on your page. And the nice thing about measuring long, uh, uh, total blocking time, um, I know in Speaker we do this, and maybe other tools do it as well, is we actually show you all the long tasks on your page. So you see which specific scripts are those, those long tasks slash blocking scripts and actually what their, their, their blocking time is. So those are really helpful to look at as companions to INP. And if you see, um, like discrepancies or big differences between the numbers that you're getting in your long tasks and total blocking time versus what you're seeing in INP, that discrepancy is probably because uh, long tasks and total blocking time are measuring all of your users and not just, you know, those Chromium based ones. Oh, oh, interesting. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. That totally makes sense. And then I guess kind of the final one that uh, thing that I would really recommend to people is um, if they're not familiar with the concept of performance budgets, um, using performance budgets to fight regressions is, uh, is like an amazing tool. Like I, you know, again, talk to a lot of companies and uh, you know, the one thing that the fastest sites, the companies that are renowned for being fast, like Pinterest, Etsy and other companies like that. The thing they have all in common is that they use some variation on performance budgets. And so a performance budget is uh, simply you tracking a metric or a few different metrics, looking at the tracking them over time, looking at kind of what is maybe your the, the worst day you had over the last two to four weeks for that particular metric, what that number was. So for example, say you had an IMP of you, you actually, you know, achieved 200 milliseconds and you don't want to get worse. You want to yep. make sure that, you know, if you get worse, you set a performance budget within whatever uh, monitoring tool you're using and you tell it to alert you when things get worse. Um, I work with Tim Cadlick, who also some of your, your audience might be, uh, know of his work. He's a great performance consultant and he used a really great analogy of like guardrails and breadcrumbs. So he talks about um, using performance budgets and testing on each deploy 
and you know kind of like firing you know when you when you do a test on a deploy it triggering um letting you know when you violated a performance budget so you just know right away right. as like guardrails and then kind of just tracking and, and and having access to all of your your test data is being kind of like the breadcrumbs so that you can kind of quickly try triangulate triage figure out what went wrong and fix it so performance budgets are an amazing tool if you're not already using them oh my goodness i i i could have a whole other podcast talk <laughs> just talk about i was actually about going to recommend budget. that you um when I was uh, doing some research for this podcast that I saw that you have um, some recent talks on performance budgets um, and videos of them are online. And so if yeah. people are interested, they should you know, go to YouTube and search for Tammy and find those performance budget talks. Yeah. Well, awesome. I've done, yeah. I've, oh, done, yeah. I've done a few talks about them and, and um, it's kind of been my main focus over the past mm -hmm. few years. Like it's, 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 it's a, it makes me feel like I'm not doing enough to know that there's this great tool, not just in speaker, like other tools have it as well. Like there's this great con conceptually, this great tool that you can use just to know that things aren't working anymore and that you're not as fast as you used to be. Right. And you could even set performance budgets on things like the, the number of scripts on your page or the total JavaScript time yeah. or total long task time, total blocking time, all of these things you can, you can create yeah. these guardrails we, I mean, for. We, we use them, even though our site doesn't, you know, doesn't have our sites pretty performance and we don't have a lot of changes, but you know, like it's helped us, um, our sites on WordPress and Jetpack has like randomly started inserting things into our web page, And then all of a sudden we see the numbers. We're like, Oh, what happened? We didn't change anything. We, you know, and then we go look and figure it out. So yeah, yep. I totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Tammy. Um, it was wonderful. This was incredibly helpful. Um, and everyone, uh, where can people find you? Oh, you can find me in a lot of places. So I'm on uh, Mastodon, um, Tammy Eberts, uh, or it might, it might just be Tammy on Mastodon on the web perf server. Um, you could find me on Twitter. I'm still calling it Twitter. Yes, at me too. Tam Eberts. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I have a personal site, TammyEverts.com. You can find me there as well and contact me through that if you have any questions. I love talking about performance, as you awesome. can tell. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tammy. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Jason.